Many times and many places in our lives, we have been lied to, talked down to, abused, and told that we are not good enough, that you don't matter. Whatever your pain or torture was, it said, you're not enough to love. And what, when what, and what comes along as true, pure, right, and ultimately love, we often question. We cannot believe in something so good that how can it be true? That this king would die for me. We need to be convinced because we have believed so much of what we've been told. And we have believed the lies to be truth. But someone, someone has witnessed us being torn to shreds. And he doesn't sit back and watch with popcorn in his hand. He is seeking us out. We cannot see this, nor can we at times feel him alluring us. But he does. But his word says in Luke 14, verse 4, I'm sorry, Luke 15, verse 4 and 5, what man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he has found it, he lay it on his shoulders, rejoicing. God rejoices over us. God called out to Adam, seeking them. Adam, Adam. And he asked Adam, who told you? You were naked. God asked us, who told you you were good for nothing? Who told you you're fat, that you were, that you were ugly, that you're stupid? Who told you you were unredeemable? Who told you you were not worthy? of my love. Who told you? I have discovered God, that God is who I never thought he was. From the very time my mother learned that she was pregnant with me, my father wanted me aborted. I felt at a very young age that my father did not want me here. I saw my father as strict, stern, cold, and unfeeling. But in reality, he was a tired, overworked man who came home pressured because the finances were low. He could not afford another mouth to feed. So when my uncles learned my mom was pregnant with me. They tried to make my mom fall in several ways to lose me. And I felt my father never really wanted me as a girl. He favored my brother because he was a boy. And so I would put on my brother's clothes, wanting to have short hair wanting my dad to be pleased with me for being the kid that he really wanted. 
I feared him. At the age of five, I started to fantasize about being with the same sex. I, I fantasize about teachers, classmates. This was an escape for me, since the real world did not comfort me. I found comfort in my fantasies instead. These fantasies, fantasies followed me throughout my elementary, junior high, high school, even college years. I had kept a secret and lived in isolation. I lived in a dark, lonely closet with a relationship with myself. I sought comfort in me, in my thoughts, in my feelings. No one could suspect that I was secretly gay while pretending to like guys. I was a liar, full of fear if anyone found out, especially my parents. But see, liars can only lie for so long. I began to be very depressed, and I masked it well. I was being torn inside, living a dual life. While I was going to church, teaching junior Sabbath school, doing outreach, going door to door. My flesh was raging inside, inside me, still fantasizing about my sisters in Christ. Just who was I, really? I remember attending Walla Walla College my sister calls and tells me that she is going to tell our parents that she is gay. That gave me all the more the reason to hide way back into that dark closet. I started to get really bitter because it did not feel normal. So I would blame God for making me this way. I decided I had enough. So I learned of a lesbian, of, I learned of lesbian chat rooms and there played out my fantasies. But that was not going to do. I wanted the real thing. Eventually my life changed drastically as I decided to move for a woman who lived in Florida that I met online. I ignored the promptings of God and would yell back in my mind to the convictions, Lisa, you're going the wrong way. I said, no, it's my turn. I'm going to do it my way. But I fell heavily into pornography. You know how one addiction leads to another. Still unsatisfied, trying to feel, trying to feel that God shaped whole. I tried to fill it with drinking and drugs and other women but none could really satisfy. It still felt incomplete. It was not until that time came where there was no way I could survive financially in Florida. The stress of trying to care for myself, for my partner, finally came to an end. Many things came to an, end, to an end that year. As I left Florida with grief in my heart, with tears running down my face on the plane, back to live with my parents, 
Little did I know, something was about to happen. And God knew. As I look back, reliving those moments of failure, I know God's mercy is real. For Micah 7, 18 says, He delights in mercy. The New Living Translation says, says it like this, because you delight in showing unfailing love. In the Bible, it says that a broken spirit dries up the bones and fear has torment. When you're fearful and your spirit is broken, you are affected in all aspects. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. I was stricken I was stricken with an autoimmune disease called systemic lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. It was not until I reached the city where my parents lived that God held my body to only break down at the hand of my mother, who did not have a clue or inkling as to why I lived in Florida. My body changed in, in ways that made me cry all the time. I would look in the mirror and see Lupus and not Lisa. I came finally to an end of myself. God got my attention. I sensed God tugging at me, subduing my anger, my sadness, my hopelessness, that how can you love me this way? Not long until I picked up the great controversy that I had an encounter with him. He spoke the words of Sister White of how the deceiver lurks around and studies us and how he suggests things. I could not put that book down. It got a hold of me. Eventually, I was led to the verse in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. It was not long after that God called me to die in the watery grave with my sister, Verna. I felt God's hand upon us. As I stood in the baptistry, tears streaming down my face, wanting to repent of everything, of every lie I told. But he gently whispered, and he said, you are mine, Lisa. For Isaiah 43, verse 1 says, O Israel, and I like to put, O Lisa, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Mm, and verse 7 really hit me. Even everyone that is called by my name for I have created him for my glory. I was created to be his, to be his daughter. 
this love was new to me. I thought my earthly father was like my heavenly father, exacting, punishing, looking down at me. But my heavenly father, he looks at me, he says, and while you were still a sinner, I died for you. You are everything to me. I always thought that his love was based on what I did or didn't do. But this love loved me enough to never leave me in the miry clay. It was not too long after that I asked God to give me proof. As humans, we need proof. Amen. Have mercy. That's right. So one morning reading John 21, I'm having devotion to the Lord. And this is where Jesus is walking along the shore with Peter. Jesus restores Peter. And he asks Peter three times, and I know you all know this, Peter, do you love me? Now, as I'm reading this, I just felt a hand on my shoulder, and he just asks me, Lisa, do you love me? I could not help but be overwhelmed with his love. And he gently told me, go, my child, tell your mom who you were, and I will be with you. My impulse was, are you sure you want me to do this? So I'm sitting at the table with my mom, I grab her hand and I felt a calm resolve and trust knowing he was going to be with me. You see, all my life I was a coward to tell the truth. I was afraid, I was full of fear that if anyone knew about me, what would happen? What would my parents do? My mind would just play out these earth-crushing finalities. But it was time for the moment of truth. It was time to take off the Band-Aid and let the air of truth permeate through the wound. For his word says, the truth shall set you free. Looking in her eyes with tears in mine, I asked her if she knew who I was really living with in Florida. She could only look at me in regret and ask, was it with a man? I shook my head. And she scrunched her face in bewilderment and said with tears streaming down my face even more and with strength that just came from up above. I said, no, it was with a woman. My eyes told her what that meant. She looked down on the table. And I saw her putting the pieces together 
in her head. And I heard her whisper, what did I do? I said right away, you did nothing. I took her to my room and we sobbed on each other's shoulder. And then she said, God is merciful, Lisa. I said, why did you say that, Ma? Because if you had told me this years ago, I would have given up on God. God knew when was the perfect timing. And so today, I live a life knowing that my daddy in heaven loves this girl. That's right. I learned many things on this journey of knowing him that I'm just a sinner in need of a savior Amen. every day. That the only thing he asks of me is to, to surrender, to be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now liveth in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. My journey never stops. My gentle healer always heals. I come up here, and it's a new layer of healing. Shortly after, I went to Weimar and got treatment for my lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And there, God helped me get off some really dangerous medications, one of which was suppressing my bone marrow. One of the treatments for systemic lupus and cancer at Weimar are fever baths. I don't know if you're all familiar with fever baths, but it induces an artificial fever. You're in 110 degree water, and you're more likely to, um, you know, uh, kind of be in delirium in, in the tub. Every day I went in that tub, I dreaded it. And every day I was in that tub, I sobbed. And every time after I did, I knew God was healing another layer. He was going deeper. And what Sister Lucille was saying earlier about tears, it really hit me. Because I can remember my therapist said, tears is the language that God understands. And sometimes I cry just because. <laughs> and I say, I know, I know, Lord. You could take another layer out. I often wonder why I got lupus. There are many possibilities, but I know as a whole, we cannot function properly if our spirit is broken. Our mind can really send messages to our body, and our body will store all the negativity, and later the effects will manifest. My body manifested all the stored up pain and emotional torture in this debilitating disease. Through the way of pain is where I can heal. And today, I praise him just because of who he is and that he is a seeker of hearts who loved me and still loves me and will always love me. He is my creator and my maker. I trust him because he loves me.